Anyway, I need to start it. <laughs> For the no priming, so if uh, you get no priming results back, usually what that means is the concentration of the DNA wasn't high enough or you didn't purify enough DNA. Usually when it says like bad quality, it means there's lots of those ends. So Esther probably went over with you of how to look at the chromatograph and you know understand the difference between an N and another, another base call. It doesn't necessarily mean the sequence is bad if they say poor quality or bad quality. Uh, still look at it and take some of the sequence and you know blast it uh, using NCBI to compare it to other sequences and stuff like that. If it says no priming, it, there's usually not going to be much data. Usually they'll send you some data, but the data is not really useful. No priming means that the primer that they used for the sequencing, the T7, didn't bind to anything. So it couldn't find any DNA or it couldn't find any matching DNA, right? So that's basically what no priming means. No priming, if you get a no priming result, you can always, uh, um, you know, re-mini prep and send it for sequencing. But you don't need to send this stuff for sequencing. Uh, sending this stuff for sequencing was basically just learning how to do all these things and getting some results back. Uh, the stuff you really have to send for sequencing is what we're going to work on for the next couple weeks. So the next couple weeks we are going to work on um, actually engineering these plasmids. Uh, yeah, so we are going to work on engineering new plasmids. What we're going to do is we're going to swap the GFP um, and we're going to move the GFP gene from the GFP plasmid into the P-Dusk and P-Dawn plasmid and move the RFP gene and the P-Dusk and P-Dawn plasmid into the GFP plasmid, right? So after you finish with that and transform and are successful, then what you want to do is send those off for sequencing just to verify you have the correct, you know, plasmid. You have the correct sequence inside. So this sequencing is kind of just uh, learning how to use sequencing and analyze it. And the next sequencing will be for actual experiments that we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to switch over and use Microsoft Paint because it's so awesome. That lets me draw. All right, so today we're going to talk about restriction digests and uh, DNA ligation, right? So we have two, we have three plasmids. We have our GFP. All right, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> and we have P dusk. and P dawn. Right? Now inside the GFP plasmid there is the GFP gene and this plasmid is resistant to ampicillin. Now inside the P dusk and P dawn plasmids there is RFP And these plasmids are both resistant to canamycin, right? So remember when we grew up those liquid broth cultures in the beginning for the mini prep, we grew up the P-Dusk and P-Dawn and canamycin, and we grew up the GFP and ampicillin. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a clever selection technique to put the GFP into the P-Dusk and the RFP into the G, into the GFP plasmid, right? So we know GFP plasmid will only grow on ampicillin. So if we put it on canamycin, it's going to die and not live, right? So what we want to do is we want to cut out the GFP, cut out the RFP, and then 
mix them together. All right? So when we mix these together in a tube, what will happen is the RFP will go in the GFP plasmid and the GFP will go in the RFP plasmid, right? And then if we plate them on ampicillin, if we see red growing on ampicillin from the RFP, it means it was successful, right? Because the P-dusk, which is red, can only grow on canamycin. GFP, which is green, can, normally green, can only grow on ampicillin. So if it's red, it means that the gene switcheroo worked. The red went into the GFP plasmid. The same is true for P-dusk and P-dawn, right? So if the P-dusk and P-dawn grows on canamycin and is green, right? If these turn to be green, that means that the gene from the GFP was successfully swapped into the P-dusk and P-dawn plasmid because a green bacteria growing on canamycin can't be this plasmid, right? This plasmid only grows on amp, ampicillin. Okay, so that's going to be our goal, right? To cut out these parts cut out the GFP, cut off the RFP, switch it into the GFP plasmid, switch the GFP into the RFP plasmid, and, you know, create these new plasmids. Okay. So how do I erase this? Select all, delete. All right. So we're going to be working with two three different things. One, restriction enzymes. There's got to be an easier way to do this. I didn't spell enzyme correctly. Two, DNA ligase. And three, transformation. So if you look at the week five guide, so this, this guide is going to be the same for week five, six, and seven. This is going to be a pretty uh, intense process of doing these three things. It'll probably take you a few days to be able to do it all and then send it off for sequencing and receive some sequencing results back. At least a week if you got everything perfect. So it'll probably take you, you know, two to three weeks we're planning on to complete these three steps. And uh, let's do four sequencing. Mini prep. Oh, well, he also needed to do a mini prep and sequencing. But yeah. Okay. All right. So... What we'll do is we'll talk about restriction enzyme, DNA ligase transformation. We've already went over sequencing a bit and mini preps. We learned how to do those things. So those things hopefully aren't new for you. You have experience with them from other stuff in the class. So don't worry too much about it. All right. All right. So restriction enzymes. All right. Let's just call it RE. How about that? Restriction enzymes. <laughs> All right. So restriction enzymes, they're also called restriction endonucleases. Um, what they do is they cut DNA. So say we got a piece of double-stranded DNA here. We got the bases on each side, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What restriction enzyme is? It's a protein that comes in and binds to DNA. And when it binds to DNA, what it does is it cuts DNA like this. So. Boop, boop, boop. And so restriction enzyme will cut DNA so that 
you have two separate parts. You have the part in the red over here. And you have this other part. Now what you can see is these two parts are overlapping, right? So this part that's cut, it's overlapping and it can still bind to the red part, right? The DNA bases, it's just cut. So there's a strand break right here and a strand break right here. So this whole thing is cut. So these two strands can separate. <laughs> now you can imagine as if we also make a cut over here. That what we are left with, we're left with two pieces of DNA, right? This is a plasmid. So we'll make this a plasmid, connect the ends. So what we're left with is two pieces of DNA. We're left with this piece right here that we cut out and we're left with the red piece and the rest of this plasmid right here. So two enzymes cut in two different spots leave us with two pieces of DNA. If we just make one cut it just kind of opens up the plasmid circle to where it becomes a linear rope or string, right? If you make two cuts that's when you separate and it gives you two pieces of DNA. <laughs> All right, so the restriction enzymes. So the restriction enzymes, we actually did not, there was a, a, a mix-up. I'm sorry about this. We did not actually send the buffers for the restriction enzymes. Those are going to be mailed out tomorrow. So you should receive them this week sometime. They're going to be mailed out tomorrow. It was a mistake. Um, we just mailed you guys the enzymes and we didn't mail you the buffers and you need the buffers to do these experiments also so uh, just sit tight for a few days you should have them by this coming weekend and you should be able to start the experiments by this weekend hopefully um, yeah don't worry about it it'll be there <laughs> get your sequencing on before right so we are using two restriction enzymes X B A 1 and X H O one. So these enzymes, what they do is they cut in two different places. So the XBA one is going to cut at the beginning of the gene. So let's say this gene is GFP or RFP. XBA one is going to cut right here and then XHO1 is going to cut right here right so when we add these two enzymes to the plasmid they should create two pieces of it two pieces of the plasmid that are separated out right so you need both restriction enzymes one to make each cut to get this out so the first experiment you're going to do is take your purified plasmid, right? Make sure you run it on the gel and you have some plasmid. If you're having trouble, a good suggestion is don't spin. When you spin down your micro centrifuge tube with the bacteria for the mini prep, spin it down multiple times, right? So don't just spin down 1.5 ml. Spin it down, dump out the excess. Spin it down again, dump it out again. Spin it down... You know, do it three or three to five times. Uh, so you have more bacteria. The more bacteria you have, the more DNA you're going to get, right? So don't go much more than five times because you get too much uh, junk then. So, you know, I would go up to five times of just like spinning it down the bacteria, dumping it out and spinning it down again. Um, it should help a lot. Make sure you follow the mini prep protocol really, really closely, and uh, you should get a pretty good yield. So you're going to start out with your plasmids that you mini prepped, right? <coughs> your GFP and your PDUSK 
and your P Dawn. So what you're going to do then is you're going to take these three plasmids and you're going to add XHO1 and XBA1. So buzzy word. A good thing to do, um, what you can do is you can go look at the plasmid maps. So you should have access to the plasmid maps for the GFP plasmid and the P-Dusk, P-Dawn plasmid. And you should be able to see what is being cut if you look between the XBA1 and XHO1. What is being cut out and what is not being cut out. So go check that out. And uh, it should be helpful to understand what's going on in the process. So we're going to add the two restriction enzymes to each of these plasmids, right? So the restriction enzymes require magnesium as a cofactor. Um, in order for the cutting to take place, we mm, accidentally didn't send the, the restriction enzyme buffer. So we're going to send that out soon. Um, you should have it, you know, hopefully by the end of this week. If not, feel free to yell at Esther. Blame Esther for it. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I don't think it's Esther's fault. <laughs> All right. So once we have cut these three things, we have tubes with each of these plus the restriction enzymes, right? Our next goal is going to be is going to be to mix the components from these. So mix the GFP with the PDUSC and mix that GFP with the PDON, right? When we mix them, you should be able to swap components. So the GFP gene should sometimes go and end up in PDUSC or PDON. And the red gene from PDUSC or PDON should sometimes end up in the GFP plasmid. Right? So that's our goal. To get some of the GFP and RFP to switch the backbone. The plasmid backbone is called the backbone. It's just the, the plasmid without any gene or anything in it. So when we refer to the backbone, that's what the backbone is. So that's all we're trying to do is get the backbone. Um, it, it might look like the video is frozen, but it's just the screen that I have up. Because uh, I am... Uh, drawing on this thing. I am here. All right. So we have these cut plasmids plus restriction enzymes in a tube. Now, if what we try to do is mix these and glue them together or ligate, they call it ligate basically glue the plasmids together. If we tried that, restriction enzymes would still be there and they'd cut anything that we tried to glue back together. So the first thing after this you have to do is you have to get rid of these restriction enzymes. Denature them, destroy them, do whatever it takes. So in order to do that, <coughs> what you have to do is uh, you have to just heat up these tubes at 65 C for 20 minutes. This should all be in the protocol document for week five. Now, heating up at 65 C for 20 minutes, you might want to go a little bit longer, you know, just to make sure you, you got everything, you killed everything. Uh, but heat it up at 65 C for 20 minutes. It's okay if you go a little bit over, don't go under. And uh, it should kill, denature all those restriction enzymes so they won't be able to cut anything anymore. Right? So that's what we want to do. Once they can't cut anything anymore, then what we want to do is we want to glue the DNAs together. Right? So we got our GFP and our PDUSC. 
So these have two parts, right? So we have the cut backbone and the cut RFP gene should be cut out. And we have the cut backbone and the cut GFP gene. So when we mix these together, what we're hoping is that the GFP gene will come over and glue itself right here in the PDUS, and the RFP gene will come over and glue itself here in the GFP backbone. This will happen some percentage of the time, right? So that's what you're just hoping for. Remember, like molecular biology is more of a probability game than anything. And what we're hoping right here is just that the probability is there will be some GFP and RFP that switch and go into the other plasma features. Okay? So in order to do this, we need to use an enzyme called a DNA ligase. DNA ligase, basically what it does is it helps seal up the ends that we cut. So it comes in and applies some glue so that we seal up these ends here so that this gene stays inside this plasma. Right? So after we heat it up, what we're going to do is mix the two plasmids and then add DNA ligase. Now, after we add the DNA ligase and we let it sit for a little while to make sure it glues back together all these plasmids, then what we need to do is we need to transform the bacteria. Now, in, if you're in the 101 class, we did some transformations. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. At the end, we played them out on agar with canamycin and ampicillin, and we should get red and green colonies on both. Yes, correct. So after this, we transform this, right? So we transform our ligated plasmid in bacteria. We did transformations in the 101 class. If you haven't do, done the 101 class, it's okay. It's not that difficult. Basically, all you're doing is growing up some bacteria and taking it and mixing the bacteria with some calcium chloride and some polyethylene glycol. These things help the, back, help the DNA get inside the bacteria. So you get these, you put these inside the bacteria. And uh, after you put them inside the bacteria, you're going to plate them on agar plates. So one agar plate will be ampicillin, and one agar plate will be canamycin. So if you already made your antibiotic stock solutions, this shouldn't be too difficult. Um, what you should just do is take the LB agar and add one microliter of your 1000x stock, if you have 1000x stock, to one, each ml, one ml. So generally, uh, you know, you want to make about 100 ml of LB agar and so that's about 3.5 grams of LB agar I think I think it's like 35 grams a liter so you would add from 100 ml you would add 100 microliters of ampicillin 1000x No, JRD, uh, it's not going to be an exact 50-50 probability, right? It depends, number one, on the concentration of both your plasmids. So when you run it out on the gel, if you're successful in doing that, what you should see is you should see by the brightness the approximate concentration. So one of them might be more brighter than the other. Um, so that could affect it. The other thing, it's like the size of the DNA could affect it. Um, there's a lot of different things that could go in and affect this. Um, so what you'll probably see is you'll probably see, because red plasmid 
because the p-dawn and p-dusk that are canamycin, you'll get some plasmids that didn't cut all the way or other things or re-ligated. You'll probably see like 90% or 95% red on canamycin. And you'll probably see the same for GFP. You'll probably see 90 to 95% green. But remember, in these experiments, all you're looking for is like one colony, right? One colony, uh, and, and it should be successful. So that's the goal is just to get the one colony from this right so after you put these on the plates right so you're gonna put half your transformation mix on the GFP plate half on the or, or half on the amp and half on the can plate and you're gonna let it grow up and see what happens right so do that for the P dusk and P dawn and you're gonna look for green on the canamycin and red on the ampicillin, right? And then when you find one of those, the next part you're going to do is you're going to do like we did before. You're going to grow up some tubes with LB and the correct antibiotic plus amp or can. And then you're going to mini prep it, right? And then after you mini prep it, you can run it out on a gel. Or if you're confident enough in your mini prep skills, you can just send it off for sequencing. Though I would always suggest running it on a gel. I haven't run out of gel. Um, being experienced as I am, having done like hundreds or thousands of these experiments, I still run it out in a gel. Um, it gives you the experience and running it out in a gel and it just, you know, there's no reason um, that uh, that you, you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't be able to do this. Pamela, uh, we have document instructions on how to make and pour plates if you haven't done it before. Um, and I can find that and post it. I'll find the instructions if you've never made and poured plates before on how to make them and pour them. Um, it's pretty easy though. Uh, your tubes of your bottles of LB agar should have a number on it, like 35 grams a liter. I know, David. Really, I really need something to write. <laughs> Microsoft Paint is not the best. Um, so, LB agar and the LB broth, right? They should say stuff on the bottle like 35 grams per liter. So you don't want to make one liter. Obviously, that's way too much. You probably want to make around 100 milliliters. So instead of 35 grams for one liter, 100 milliliters is 10 times less. So you only need 3.5 grams for 100 milliliters. So add 3.5 grams of the LB agar to the water. Tap water is fine. Um, and then mix it up and heat it. Right? And then after you heat it, make sure you've already mixed up your antibiotics. So you can mix them up in water at the concentrations that we have used for the LB broth previously. So 100 uh, milligrams per ml for ampicillin, 50 milligrams per ml for canamycin. And then you add one microliter per one ml. So if you use 100 mls of LB agar, you add 100 microliters of your antibiotic, right? 100 mls of uh, LB agar should pour about three plates. Um, three to four plates, probably. So it should be enough for this experiment for sure. 
But yeah, we have instructions on how to pour plates. We'll post it to the classroom. Um, so, yeah, well, T. Williams, you ask, uh, is two microliters of loading dye enough for each 10 microliter sample? So loading dye is not expensive, so I definitely don't skimp on the loading dye, right? I, I, I always do a minimum of three or four microliters of loading dye no matter what. It's just there's no reason to skimp on it, um, and it it might make it so your, your samples don't go in your gel really well. So don't skimp on the loading dye. Use more. One thing that can happen is if during your mini prep, you after you do the wash step, if you don't spin it long enough after the wash step, uh, not all the ethanol will come out. And if not all the ethanol comes out, what happens is there's some ethanol then in your DNA sample. Ethanol totally messes it up when you try to load it in a gel, right? Because the density of ethanol just throws everything off. So sometimes you just need to spin it for extra long after. Uh, generally, when I do mini preps, I tend not to time it. I tend to do something else while I'm doing it and just let it spin for a little while, you know. If it's like one minute, try not to time it and only let it spin for one minute. Try to let it spin for two, three, four minutes. Um, let it spin a little bit extra time because sometimes there's just a little bit extra liquid in there that needs to get out or something. So don't skimp, don't skimp on the spinning time. Uh, you might save a few minutes, but in the end there might be liquids and stuff left in. So, you know, try to uh, try to spin it for a little bit longer if you have the chance. Yeah, so the experiments I talked about today should take a fair bit of time. So the next few weeks in class, we're just going to be talking about this stuff. We're going to be troubleshooting the process with everybody and trying to figure out what's going on. So when you're doing these experiments, make sure you take pictures, copious amounts of pictures along the way. Make sure you document really well. So make sure everything you do, you document, right? If something looks funny, write it down. If something, you know, whatever, write it down. Write down everything. Write down the exact temperatures you use and everything. No, fuzzy, wordy, 09. <laughs> you cannot overspin. When you're using a centrifuge and you're spinning stuff down for mini preps, you can never overspin. You can never spin too long. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you leave it in there for like two days spinning, other stuff bad might happen. But generally, you can't spin for too long. Right? It shouldn't be a problem at all. So, yeah, these experiments are probably going to take you the remainder of this class. So, what I'm hoping is that people get results sometime in the next two or three weeks and then we can start going over those results analyzing those results and figuring out the next steps how to order synthetic DNA yourself to how to put your own gene that you want into the plasmid right so that's the next step after this is to put our own synthetic genes in plasmids not just genes that are already already out there Okay. So anybody have any questions? So there should be a document for week five that explains the steps of everything we're going to do. And it should have some sort of timing on it also. Um, so if you go to if you go to the classroom and the Google Classroom and you look at classwork in week five, uh, go to the README doc. README for week five. Week five README should have instructions and descriptions of all the stuff that's going on. If you have any questions, you know, post it in the classroom. Ask. But it's going to be, it's going to take a bit of time. It's not something that's going to be short for any of this stuff. And especially your first time but that's okay take it slow take it easy you can do it in like two hour segments 
right? And not all the time is doing stuff. So a lot of times it's like do something for 30 minutes or one hour and then incubate it or let it sit, right? So it's not going to be constantly working and doing stuff. So try to do it in, uh, you know, little sections. Maybe, you know, maybe like we have it. So after you have your mini prep, then do your restriction digest. And after you do restriction digest, you can just put it in the freezer. After you do restriction digest, take some time and ligate the DNA together. And then put it in the freezer. Right? And then when you have time, you can grow up a plate for an overnight for your transformation. So putting the DNA inside bacteria. And, uh, you know, that'll take... A few hours and then once you put that on the plate and grow it and then your mini prep that's going to take us some more growing up time right so this is going to be an extensive process but this is the process you're going to go through every time you want to make your own custom DNA yourself so learning this process is the quintessential process in being a genetic engineer a bioengineer this is the, the, the process that everybody should know if they're going to do bioengineering. David, there's too much green background when viewing under UV. Oh, okay. That's unfortunate. Uh, I mean, David, so you should... You generally shouldn't need to use more ladder that's in the protocol. If you're having trouble seeing it, um, there could be a couple reasons. One, make sure you're using TAE buffer in the gel. Make sure you're not mixing the agarose with the gel with water. If you're mixing the agarose gel with water, a lot of times it's going to make it difficult to see any of the DNA or any of the ladder or anything like that. So make sure you're mixing the agarose gel with TAE buffer and not water, right? The other thing is make sure that you're using the, the UV glasses, the orange glasses or filter, and you have lights off and everything like that, right? Make sure you're in a pitch black room, take it in your bathroom, shut off all the lights, and try to look at it in there or that way. Then if you still can't see it, after doing all those things, you can't see the ladder, um, then talk to us and we'll help figure out what's going on. But if you want to help troubleshoot, right, if you want us to help troubleshoot, make sure you get, document things as thoroughly as possible because the way that we help are going to help troubleshoot you is we're going to ask you questions, right? We're going to ask you questions of like, um, like uh, how much of this did you use? How long did you do this? How long did you do that, right? So make sure you have those things. Uh, Pamela, you still have your LB antibiotics plasmid in the tube. Is Did you spin? I assume that means you didn't spin down the bacteria. It's still in culture. If the bacteria are still in a liquid culture, it's probably not good. You probably can't reuse it, Pamela. You probably need to create new culture from scratch. Um, what you can do is every time you grow up, bacteria make sure you spin down all the bacteria and then put it in the freezer and you can reuse the bacteria that you already grew up if you stored it in the freezer whenever you want <coughs> so that's always a thing that can buzzy wordy i believe the ladder came with the kit was too sp yeah so the plasma should be bigger than the biggest band in the uh, ladder. It's not because the plasmid is bigger than that in the ladder. It's just the way plasmids run on agarose gels because plasmids are these circular pieces of DNA and agarose gels are meant for linear pieces of DNA. Right? So it's not linear, so it's going to run differently. It's a strange size. So it's going to run higher up. You'll, you'll see it above the top band on your ladder. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it, Pamela. Um, just it, it, I wouldn't really use it because there's probably contamination by now in cultures that have been left around for a few weeks. So just start over. It's better to start over. Always 
never assume in molecular biology and genetic engineering. So if you question like, uh, did I do that right? The answer is probably not. So always err on the side of being safe, right? Always err on the side of like making sure you're doing it correctly because you don't want to, in this experiment especially, right? You don't want to be like go through one week worth of experiments only to find out that you don't have any plasmid because you never ran an agrose gel, right? Like that would be traumatizing. So don't do that. Make sure you know what's going on at every step as much as possible and make sure you follow things as you know close to the protocol as you can to get the results. Be very strict on yourself. Very strict. All right. Any other questions for right now? Like I said, if you didn't get the chance, make sure you purify your, your plasmids and run it out in a gel. Make sure you see something on the gel before proceeding because if you don't see anything on the gel, you're just going to your, cause yourself heartbreak. If you can, send it off for sequencing, right? It's good to set up an account on GeneWiz and everything anyway. And like I said, it's only like six bucks to send it off for DNA sequencing, so send something off. Um... If the sequencing is bad or doesn't work, it also lets you know that the plasmid prep wasn't good, even if you see something on the gel. So it's it's a good uh, quality control thing, send stuff off for sequencing, right? So get to that step first. Purify your plasmid, run it out of gel, send it off for sequencing. All right. Just keep asking questions. Feel free to ask questions on the class. Ask them on the class, uh, Google Classroom as much as possible because then you'll be surprised. A lot of people probably have the same questions as you. So make sure you try to ask them on the classroom unless you need immediate assistance. Um, yeah, because help everybody else also learn.